Okay, um, thank you for coming. Um, just following on from the breaks, as say roughly 12-ish, uh, we'll have a short break and then quite a long break at one. And then later in the afternoon, another break after about an hour. Um, that's when I'll take questions. So if you have got any burning questions, um, try and remember them or write them down. Um, and I'll take questions in the break and then over lunch I'll be around if you've got any questions or want to chat about anything. Just keeps it um, flowing a bit easier. So, um, quite a lot to cover. Um, the idea today is to try and sort of create a map, an overview, um, looking at human origins, sort of who we are, how we got here, and then with a particular focus on our current state of mind. Um, I've been very concerned, like a lot of people have, for the last 20 odd years about what we're doing collectively as a species. We seem hell bent on destroying each other and destroying the place we live. And despite <coughs> increasing recognition of that, we're still doing exactly the same as we were doing 20, 30, 50 years ago. Um, so I became, I became very interested in trying to, I guess, look at why we're doing this. And obviously there's lots of ideas out there already. Um, and I, I had a bit of a background in plant biochemistry, plant evolution. So I was coming at it from a slightly different perspective. But it seemed to join up quite nicely because there's a lot of evidence that supports the idea that we spent a long period of our distant past living in the forest. Um, and it struck me there might be some clues there. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, what impact our past had on our current state of mind and whether there's a way perhaps to improve our state of mind and stop behaving so insanely. Um, there will be a lot of pieces. Initially, some of them might not seem to fit together. They might seem a little bit out of context. So I'm going to suggest you just run with that and hopefully towards the end of the talk, it all kind of joins together. Uh, if it doesn't, then I haven't done a very good job. So um, we'll just start moving through some of the slides. Um, as I say, pretty big questions. That is really my objective. Um, obviously, I, I am proposing some ideas, um, some partial answers, but I'm really interested in are we asking the right questions? Um, in fact, we, as a certainly Western culture, we seem quite indifferent to the deeper causes of what we're doing. We've lost, I guess, what was a, a more ancient obsession with our state of mind. And it's now a case of get a job and go and buy some crap that we don't need. And it doesn't matter about the damage we do. So it's really about asking questions, asking questions that maybe we don't ask anymore. Um, I pulled a lot of research together in the 1990s and then in rather a hurry, uh, as I, I thought I might have stumbled onto something interesting, I um, compiled it into a book. It took a while to get published, about 2007, um, left in the dark. And it's a fairly obvious play on words, uh, really a comment on our current direction, I think, um, what on earth we're we're doing with ourselves uh, as a society or what our objectives are but it also draws a lot on left right brain um, research which i'm sure many of you you've heard of it's sort of fallen out of favor a little bit in the last 10 or 20 years but i think that's a big mistake um, so i'm going to be drawing on neurology psychology and particularly left right brain research and suggesting that there is a really big clue there as to why we find it so difficult to figure out what's going on and why we keep repeating the same patterns, the same mistakes that usually end up in catastrophic collapse of civilization and nobody does very well out of it. Um, this is essentially an attempt at a diagnosis. Um, so I will be focusing quite a lot on things that seem quite challenging, maybe overwhelming. But the idea is if we can get an accurate diagnosis as to what's going on, then it becomes more plausible to start treating whatever it is and coming up with some solutions. Um, in essence, I don't think I'm saying anything new. In fact, I think there were clues in a lot of the ancient traditions, 
the sort of ancient Arcadian traditions, the ancient mythology, uh, the kind of origins of the spiritual and shamanic traditions, right the way through into some of the more structured religions. There's a solid story in there that um, seems to tell us quite clearly that we were heading into trouble and the trouble lay somewhere within us, somewhere in our state of mind. Um, so I'm going to suggest that is a very real, um, a very accurate history. It's just become a little bit distorted and we're not, or well, we don't find it's easy to understand anymore, in part because of the state of mind we have now. I'm going to start with a little summary. Um, and you can, once you've kind of assimilated this, you can check this against the presentation as we go through. Does it fit? Does it make any sense? And also whether it makes any sense of your own life, your own sort of sense of what's going on and how you perceive other people and basically how society seems to be working at the minute. So I'll let you read that just for a moment. Everybody see that? Do you want me to read it? Okay, I will have a go. I'm a bit dyslexic, but... Uh, so you think you've heard of all the left-right brain theories. Well, how about this one? Your left hemisphere is a hormonally retarded, perceptually limited, and cogni cognitively impaired version of your right hemisphere. Your left hemisphere is perceptually dominant. It defines who you are, and it, defines, it decides who you think you are. Uh, this theory is unique in that it is not a left brain explanation, but a right brain, brain explanation. Tried against the neurological data, does it fit? So really, this is kind of a challenge. Is it possible that the part of our brain that dominates our sense of who we are, a perception that kind of runs the show, is actually quite a limited, quite a damaged version of the side of our brain that we don't have much access to? And would that make any sense, as I say, of our day-to-day -day lives and the society and uh, structures that we've created? Is it possible, basically, that we have a gremlin in our brain and we're, that, the part of our brain we're using makes it very difficult to spot that? Um, the kind of the standard story that's come out of Western science, and I'll say quite early on, I think there's a lot of fantastic data Western scientists come up with in the last 50, 100 years or so. Really good data. Um, I'm very cautious about how we interpret that data. They're not the same thing. So relatively object da objective data can be very useful, but we have to be very cautious about our interpretation. And that includes the academics, the experts, the authors who've interpreted the data. Because what I'm going to keep pointing out is um, we may not be as objective as we think. We may be trapped by the limits of our mind and it's very difficult to see. So anyway, the kind of current thinking, it's been around for a while, that um, our distant origins were something to do with the forest. We spent a huge period of our evolutionary past in the forest. Uh, generally assumed that we didn't get up to much. We weren't building... Um, spaceships, I, some people think we were, but there's not much solid evidence emerged of that. Um, we really didn't get clever until we came out of the forest. We started inventing things like the wheel, like fire, speech, and it was only when we came out of the forest, because of the harsh conditions, we became intelligent. And eventually we ended up creating these technological marvels, so in modern cities and modern technology. And particularly in the last 50 years or so, things have accelerated enormously. Um, and we've been sold this idea that more of the same is better. We're getting more advanced. If you look around, you can see the evidence everywhere. Everything from smartphones to fast cars to jets to, to whatever else. There are some problems with that picture, um, and we're all familiar with it to some degree, but I think it's easy to forget how we might react if we weren't familiar with this. We sort of grow up with these kind of images of ecological destruction and warfare, and by degrees we do find it shocking. 
but it's also become very familiar. It's almost acceptable that, for example, we pay taxes to have an army or an air force because that's necessary, and we spend vast amounts of some of money on technology effectively designed to kill each other. In fact, the very best of a technology does tend to come out of military research and development. And the defense systems tend to underpin most Western economies. Um, and the bare bomb figures, I think we've killed at least 100 million of our own kind in the last 100 years. It's 100 million of our own kind we've killed by our own devices, which I find incredibly shocking. If that's not a sign of sociopathic and psychopathic behavior, I don't know what is. Um, <clears throat> these so-called advanced civilizations, typically throughout history and certainly now, tend to be built on slavery and exploitation. And we might have shifted the terminology a little bit in recent times. We might have got away of some of, from some of the more obvious exploitation. But really, it's just a thin veneer. Um, Pretty much everything we buy, say in the UK or in Western culture, if you follow the supply chains, you end up with situations like this. Massive poverty and exploitation. Children down mines and so on and so on, still going on. Most of the stuff we use, the stuff I'm using here today, somewhere along the line, it's tainted with exploitation yet that's incorporated into our advanced view of the world. So I'm just pointing out fairly obvious anomalies, and it's amazing how we incorporate this into our day-to-day -day lives, and we don't question it anything like as much as we should. We tend not to refuse to buy the equipment. We tend not to do the research. And then even within the midst of some of the most so-called advanced civilizations, um, all is not as it's supposed to be. It's getting increasingly difficult to walk around any sort of medium-sized town and not see people totally disconnected, homeless, malnourished, and feeling completely lost. And a huge number of people not far away from that, just hanging on stressed, desperately running around in circles to try and stay plugged into this relentless game of monopoly. So when you actually, when you actually speak to people, rather than listening to the sales pitch, um, our advanced culture is full of holes. Basically an epidemic of stress and depression, degenerative diseases, Massive increase in the last hundred years. And nobody's really happy, or it seems very rare. There's a superficial happiness that comes out of a degree of security, but it's born out of this relentless pressure and just managing to hold things together. And we get a brief sense of anticipation when we buy something and then it's gone again. So again, just pointing out that there are serious problems with our idea of advanced. Um, prior to Western history, or Western science, um, and the ideas of our origins and so on, which I think, again, some of the data is very good. Prior to that, our natural history was locked up in various oral traditions, and some of it has been written down um, and encoded into some of the more orthodox religious traditions. And they tell a parallel story, but with a kind of different direction. Instead of us becoming increasingly advanced, the universal theme in these traditions is that at one time we were in a very different state of mind. A state of mind that's actually very difficult to describe or relate to now. And that state of mind is generally alluded to in positive terms. They're not just a little bit. It's not like things were a wee bit better. Terms that tend to come out 
to describe these archaic states were things like divine rapture, perpetual sense of wonder. Now, is there any truth to that? Well, we'll see. But it's interesting that even today, people can get glimpses of states that sound very like that. And the neurology is interesting how it crops up, whether it's spontaneous, whether it's through techniques. But all these traditions allude to a state, say, where we perceived ourselves very differently. They talk about being in harmony with our environment. It wasn't just um, a concept. It wasn't like reading a book and you think, well, we should act differently. People really felt this. They felt a direct connection with where they lived and how they lived and with each other. Our relationship with each other was very different. And these terms are bandied around a lot, especially in some of the kind of more modern spiritual traditions, but they've been around for a long time. And then this talk, or what you get or talk of, is something changed. And it's a very distant his history. In our distant past, something changed. It's often related to some kind of ecological catastrophe, sometimes quite detailed, sometimes quite vague. And as this catastrophe unfolded, something about our state of mind began to change. And instead of this very different sense of self, this kind of divine connected sense of self, a different self began to emerge. Um, it could be described as the sort of emergence of a a minor sense of self and eventually it became stronger and stronger and it had the traits that we'd recognize today um, disconnected frightened needs to be in control and these ancient stories suggest eventually it took over and this much more ancient state slowly got lost i'm going to suggest that history for all that it's it comes in sort of many, um, many interpretations, the general theme is always the same. And in fact, there's also clues, I think, in the traditions that have practices, um, techniques and practices. Many of them exist in different traditions. Some of them are very similar, some of them cross over. So early on, I'm going to suggest that these practices, these religious and spiritual practices, to put it in a different language, to give it a different perspective, they were really treatments for a neurological condition. We'd begun to recognize we had a problem with our perceptual equipment, our neural system, and we began devising treatments to try and slow the problem, repair the damage. And when you look at all these traditions, which we will do in a bit more detail later, some interesting commonalities come out. And they all seem to be about finding ways to inhibit our normal sense of self and stimulate this latent, this lost sense of self. And it kind of makes sense if our ancestors were in better shape than we are, and I'm talking psychologically and perceptually, um, and if something did start to happen, and typically when you have mild cognitive impairment, mild neurological problems, let's say mild mental health problems, it's typically you're aware of it. It's not, it's not um, a great leap. We, we can tell if we've got mild problems. As the problems get worse, we can lose sight of the fact we've got problems at all. And one, one th theme that crops up a lot in these traditions is a generic, a species-wide slide into delusion in virtually every tradition, very specific, we were becoming more deluded. And these, these traditions have a very long origin. So we've been locked into this process for a long time. In fact, a lot of the traditions talk about one catastrophic failure after another, the ages of man mythology, uh, the kind of golden age, then something happened and we became a bit less functional and something else happened and so on. So if these traditions have any validity, they're talking about a series of events and a series of processes, and we're at the wrong end of that. It's not a mild condition anymore. It's quite a severe condition. And we all understand, I guess, the term delusion, being deluded. But how do we know if we are actually deluded? Simply because we understand that term. <clears throat> 
course, there might be objective clues. It might not be easy to self-assess. It's easy to wake up in the morning and go, well, I feel fine, everything's okay. There's some crazy things going on out there, but it's not me. Of course, everybody wakes up thinking the same thing. So it's whether we're able to look in the mirror, look at our lives, look around us, and begin to start recognizing things that don't quite add up in the way that maybe they should. And the flip side of that is um, these traditions, they do allude to what today we tend to call altered states of consciousness. Um, again, many interpretations, but there are some generic themes that crop up in all these states. They can occur spontaneously, and there are accounts of them going back right throughout written history, several thousand years at least, um, and then alluded to in these oral traditions that are much older. Um, and they're still occurring today. People still have events today, kind of life-changing events. Sometimes they only last a few minutes and they're so powerful they can change people's life direction completely. And they tend, the language people tend to use is a completely different sense of self. My normal sense just fell away. There was something much bigger than me emerged. And there's these kind of labels that tend to suggest it's pretty cool. It's not, well, it was okay. It's normally a struggle to find superlatives, divine rapture, profound, life-changing. If you could stay in that state, you would stay in it. And these states are also correlated quite well with enhanced cognitive function. It's not a very pleasant idea, the idea that we might be becoming slowly more stupid and totally unaware of that. But it's kind of a nice idea that we might have a lot of function locked away. We might have a lot of um, high cognitive function locked away. And again, we'll get to some more of the evidence that these states and related states do seem to suggest that our current idea of how smart we are is all back to front. There are people who have access states with phenomenal abilities and it all correlates to the same neurology. It's not our day-to-day -day brain that we're using Otherwise, those abilities would be there. It's some other state of being that if we can access it and work with it, phenomenal abilities can start to emerge. And again, just, just to keep this in mind, there's a few things to juggle. And as I keep mentioning them, you can keep bringing them to bear. It's just trying to put yourself in the state of mind, of trying to imagine trying to figure out what's going on through a lens that maybe is not as focused as it could be, not as sharp as we'd like to think. And is it possible to then accommodate that and begin looking around us, looking at the data, and begin to see a pattern emerge that suggests there is a problem with our perception. I'm coming out of the split brain research, which tends to correlate extremely well with these ancient traditions. When people are locked into their dominant hemisphere, which is always the left hemisphere, the left uh, cerebral cortex, um, certain traits emerge. And it's been generally labeled, or these traits have generally been labeled as highly specialized and highly advanced. The problem with that is by definition, and this includes the people doing the research, the neurologists, the researchers, they're all using that same piece of their brain to look at their own data and to come up with these ideas. So, for example, human speech is often seen as a highly advanced form of communication, the kind of communication I'm using now. And yet, um, coming out of the neurological re uh, research, our left brain is typically limited to speech particularly as it matures, as we go through puberty, that's its default position. And yet our right hemisphere can sing if we can get access to it. Much, much richer form of communication, much, much more information in there, not just the concepts. And yet most of us, I certainly include myself, would find it quite frightening for some reason to try and sing. Um, so, I'm just pointing these clues out, and as I say, this picture will hopefully build that we have potential mechanisms locked in us. Some people have some access, some people more. 
lot of us don't have any access at all and they seem more advanced and yet we're stuck with our day-to-day -day self and we've been told all along that it's actually more advanced but we may have it back to front and again if you try and imagine the world without labels without concepts and the left brain is given this kind of accolade of its well it now works in concepts it has ideas and beliefs as if somehow that's better than reality and we describe ourselves in fact most of us when you, when i speak to people most of us have internal dialogue we even talk to ourselves we have to tell ourselves what we're doing and what we're going to do as if somehow we didn't know what we're going to do anyway but this mad voice in our head and again, most of us would probably feel uncomfortable sharing the contents of that endless chattering with our partners or our closest friends, let alone anyone else. Because for the most part, it comes out with all sorts of crazy stuff. And yet everybody's got that going on. So I'm just again suggesting that in the midst of normality, there might be some pretty big clues that we've got some serious problems in our head, but we're so used to them and so is everybody else we all know the rules we all play the games we all know the things we're supposed to say and not to say and if we step outside of that we get sectioned and put in the funny farm so um having done done a lot of trawling through the the data and various traditions and so on and I started doing a lot of experiments using what might be called ancient practices, but as I say, I'm referring them more to treatments. Um, I started coming to the tentative conclusion that there was something seriously wrong with my brain. Um, there's something quite strange going on in there. Um, part of it did feel incredibly clumsy, very frightened, very locked in, terrified that anybody would ever see that. And yet through some of these approaches, it was quite clear there was something else that was pretty damned amazing. So juggling all these pieces around, it looked to me like the dominant part of our brain is where the problem is. It's very difficult to see because that's where we're normally locked into. A little bit like, I suppose, if you've seen that kind of classic Hollywood version of these kind of things, the Matrix. Um, bit like being in the matrix and even if you have an understanding you're in the matrix you still don't perceive it you're still locked into the ideas of it it's only when you start fiddling with the circuitry and some of the kind of delusion breaks down that you actually get a glimpse of something else and that's what all these ancient approaches were about somehow messing around until you could break that delusion and get a sense of reality what's actually really going on in yourself and everywhere else so just some basic summaries on neurology again you may be familiar with this um, lots of data from the last 50 60 years and People have been aware of this to some degree, going back much, much longer. It's, it crops up in a lot of traditions, talking about two selves. It's in, it's in North American tradition. It comes out of some of the early European traditions. And as I say, modern urology has come to a similar conclusion. Um, each hemisphere has distinct traits. And it certainly came out of research, I think, in the 60s. I've got a couple of video clips if we've got time to look at them, uh, where not only are there specialized abilities, but quite distinct sense of self, very different sense of self with each hemisphere. Trouble is, they're not normally isolated. We're normally running on one hemisphere, it's very dominant, and the other hemisphere is somewhat subdued. It doesn't really get a look in. But as soon as you recognize this, as soon as you begin to see the pattern, then it's quite clear that the hemisphere that's in charge, if there's a problem there, then we have to be very, very careful about everything it comes up with, particularly the conclusions. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm going to throw a few slides in as well just to show you the kind of areas that I think are worth looking at. Initially, they might not seem like they're related, some more so than others, um, and where you can find lots of interesting, again, fairly objective data. The idea is once you lay all this data out, a fairly simple pattern begins to emerge. Um, I got interested in human sleep. Uh, more than 20 years ago, in part because it kept coming up in some of these practices or treatments. It's there in Vision Quest, um, it's there in the kind of Buddhist tradition. It's also, um, there's a section on sleep or sleep reduction in the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the earliest texts we have, uh, sort of Sumerian hieroglyphs or whatever they were, cuneiform. Um, this kind of archaic story of the initiate trying to find, in essence, trying to find the lost consciousness of the ancestors. And there's various challenges that the initiate has to go through. And the very last challenge is to stay awake for seven days and seven nights. Now, in modern sleep research, that would be an abhorrence. It's like, well, if we don't get our six or eight hours, we become dysfunctional. It's going to be very bad for your mental health. You can basically go mad and so on. And I think there is some truth to that. But once you start again looking at the neurological data and looking at the patterns in the data, it starts to make sense that actually we have twin sleep requirements. Our rational mind, our left brain, needs a lot of sleep. Why? Because it doesn't work very well. It's got very weak batteries. So you tire it out, you get to 10 o'clock, midnight, you had a long day at work, irritable, all you want to do is go to sleep. If for any reason you have to stay up, if you've got young children or you've got partying or whatever, um, you can start to notice clues. Speech can become slurred as you get more tired. Um, you can get clumsy. It's definitely not a good idea to operate machinery or drive a car. However, other things start to happen. Typically, people become more emotional and more socially engaged. That's why we tend to socialize in the evenings, our kind of Normal left brain defense mechanisms are a bit weaker, they're down a bit. Um, and in these traditions, they talk, they talk about purposely staying awake for several days to access these lost states. And again, there are clues, even in kind of modern interest and research from lucid dreaming, dream insights, even sleepwalking. What's going on with sleepwalking? We go to sleep and we wake up somewhere else, and something took us somewhere else highly advanced, highly complex abilities. I don't know if anybody has experienced sleepwalking. Uh, I, I did once as a child, it was quite bewildering. I went to bed and woke up in the garden. I had no idea how I got there. But again, researching this is quite common. In fact, people have even used it as a defense in criminal trials, where people have been caught robbing banks and doing all sorts of stuff and blamed it on the fact they were asleep. I don't know how true all of it is. It's a good defense, but nevertheless, there is evidence that we can engage in very complex activity when apparently we're asleep. But if you start looking at it, as I say, in the split brain research kind of perspective, and you imagine that our normal hemisphere needs a lot of sleep, you tire it out, it doesn't like it. But if you keep pushing, keep pushing, if you stay awake, as these ancient traditions suggest, then its ability to stay in charge starts to weaken. And I think that's what they were interested in. If you stay awake long enough, this kind of concept-based, endless chattering mind starts to lose control. And as it starts to lose control, other things start to emerge. And as I say, initially, the clues are things like you feel more emotional, um, feel more relaxed. Um, and then people, uh, and there are a lot of accounts of this, start getting glimpses of feeling more creative, more euphoria. Um, lots of information on this. Why on earth would that start to happen? as we get more tired. I, um, I got fascinated with that, and I spent about two years doing nothing but sleep elimination, anything from about two days to seven days. Session after session, I'd have a night where I'd sleep a bit, then start again. And I noticed a lot of fascinating things began to happen, um, mostly perceptual, mostly psychological, which was my main interest. And obviously that can be difficult 
to quantify, difficult to measure, and you get a lot of people say, well, it's just self-delusion, it's hallucinations. If you, if you become very tired, your brain becomes dysfunctional. Um, and again, I think there's some truth in that, but you can move beyond that. However, I also noticed um, that during these periods without sleep, sort of three or four days without sleep was quite a, an interesting window. I'd feel like I had a lot more energy, a lot more stamina, a lot more strength. And I thought, well, that's measurable. That's something that can be tested. So I managed to persuade Manchester University to run some tests. Um, I wanted to do seven days because that, that was the ancient window or the traditional window. I um, wanted to see what showed up in all their measuring equipment. Um, and although they agreed to do the study, they were quite worried their ethics board or ethics committee would only let me do five days because they were frightened I'd either go mad or I'd die, which wouldn't have looked very good for them and wouldn't have been very good for me either. Um, so I went up there. I did actually cheat. I uh, cheated in such a way that didn't do me any favours. I stayed up for two days before I went up there because I was kind of running my own experiments. Really just wanted to get my hands on their equipment. So we did this experiment. Um, I'd made the case, I said, well, look, all the modern data suggests I should become severely dysfunctional, particularly in certain areas like balance, coordination. And the guy who was running the department, uh, the reason I think he took the project on, he was ex-military. I don't know if he was special services or whatever, but he, he'd done a lot of military training to stay awake and be functional, because it's a big headache for the military. How do you keep people awake and functional so they can kill other people when they're out on the field for days on end. And he was pretty sure that I was deluded, um, but he thought it'd be an interesting experiment anyway. And I said, look, if I can keep steady state, if I can maintain my function throughout this five day period, that in itself is an anomaly that shouldn't exist. What actually happened, and it became apparent quite early on, we did all these baseline tests and my abilities began to improve as the I was tested I think every three hours different tests I was filmed and had people with me 24 7 so I couldn't sneak off and have a sleep um, and particularly in areas that they were most interested in like balance like coordination um, I improved and not only that I'm strongly right-handed normally and I'd noticed this myself in all my kind of um, self-experimentation. As I stayed awake, my left hand became more functional. Normally, it's pretty useless, like a lot of people who are strongly handed. We focus on our good hand, well, that's cool, but why have we got this bloody clumsy useless thing that just won't do anything that it's supposed to, particularly fine control? Well, it began to improve, and eventually, it got better than my right hand. And it tied in with some other research, I think I touch on it in the book, that suggests our handedness isn't genetically fixed as many researchers think. It's simply a twisted kind of product of cerebral dominance, the fact that we have one hemisphere that tends to dominate. And if you start changing dominance, your handedness change, and lo and behold, you get more function out of your non-dominant hand. If people have touched on it in other ways, I think there's a classic book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, which encourages you to use your non-dominant hand, usually your left hand, and kind of work it from that angle, sort of the tail wagging the dog. The more you practice with your non-dominant parts, the more they stimulate, stimulate action or um, change the dominance. But anyway, as far as I know, that's the only study that's been done testing the idea that sleep isn't quite what we think of it with... Um, one thing I, I don't know if you can read it on there, I had done about three years before this experiment was I'd changed my diet. Um, I'm not keen on the word diet, it's really advanced molecular engineering, but I changed the materials that I build and run my brain on. I tried to go back to what I thought was a primate-like diet, a sort of forest-like diet. Very complex biochemistry. We know the brain's very sensitive to chemistry and so on. So I put that in place about three or four years before and then gone into this experiment and got some interesting results. And they, uh, they'd committed to publishing, said they'd publish the results. They were so confident they were going to find an example of delusion. When it was clear the results weren't as they expected and better than I expected, 
they got cold feet. They said, well, this is fascinating. We can't explain it. They didn't like my explanation because it was a bit too radical, the idea that the whole of humanity's got a damaged brain. So they said, OK, well, we'd run some more experiments, which I was fine with, but they didn't have any funding. They said, well, we've got, we've got no more funding to do this. So that's as far as I got with that. Uh, the data exists, but it was never formally published, and there was no money to do any more experiments. That was in 1998. I'm not aware of any experiments since then that have taken humans running on the chemistry that we know we run on in the forest and tested our neural system, which is, to me is a massive gap in our understanding. All modern neurology presumes our neural system is functioning, so we kind of take our neural system like it fell out of the sky and try and figure out how it works. But it's really bad science because we've presumed our neural system actually works in the first place. And yet, coming out of that same research is a massive body of evidence, which we'll get to, that suggests our neural system not only doesn't work as well as it could, but it's actually in really poor shape. So another area, again, um, where I think there's a lot of interesting clues, <clears throat> hypnosis, and uh, I think it's been around in various guises for a long time. Um, obviously has various modern applications, therapeutic entertainment, all sorts of things. Um, but it does tend to be a way to circumvent or get around our normal sense of self, our dominant left hemisphere, our kind of dominant ego mind. Find a way to kind of trick it or bore it into shutting down or distract it, anything so you can get access to this other sense of self that's kind of hidden behind it. And there are quite a lot of books on the subject, including a book by David Pedersen, I think. And he made the connection very well, I think, with hypnosis and left-right brain research. So I'd recommend his book if you can find it. It's still, you still see it on eBay. Basically suggesting that our day-to-day -day self isn't all that functional. If you want to get at the really cool stuff, it's not there. It's not in our day-to-day -day self. It's somewhere else. And why on earth would that be? Why would we have better memory, better insight, better intelligence locked away that we don't normally get access to? What on earth is the point of that? And there are people now, I think, I don't know if Richard Bandler or other people are using hypnosis as part of and I think it's kind of resurrected an ancient approach using hypnosis or hypnotic techniques to get into altered states in a more spiritual sense. It's not just medicinally therapeutic, but it's, again, to access these latent states. So people are starting to make these connections now. Handedness I've kind of already touched on, but again, I think it's a massive clue. Um, most of us are strongly handed. There are a few examples of people who are ambidextrous, fascinating. Um, and again, it's seen as an advanced trait. When you read about handedness, it came out of specialized in spear throwing or some such thing. Um, and other animals do have preference. A lot of animals have what they call poor preference. They'll preferentially use one side of the body, but they can use the other side equally as well if needs be. Why on earth? We have a hand that just doesn't work very well. What on earth is the point of that? However, is it simply a physical symptom of our lopsided function? Quite harsh, but I think that's more accurate. Just going to keep an eye on the time. Um, how long have we been running? OK. Um, so I'm, I am going to touch on uh, modern interpretations. As I say, I think modern scientific data is excellent. Um, just be wary of the conclusions and then see how it marries up to some of these ancient ideas. And even there, I think we still have to be a little bit wary of relatively recent interpretations. If, if humanity's been sliding into delusion, as these traditions claim, and we've been losing cognitive function, then our ability to communicate ideas or even under, understand ideas is going to change. And we, we tend in this culture to have grown up with the idea that ancient ideas are primitive, not very bright, and we're really clever now. 
but it could simply be that we've lost the capacity to understand ideas that were formatted in a very different form, more poetic, um, more contextual, more pictorial, we tend to see them as something we don't quite understand very well and they're not very advanced. We may have it completely back to front and that these ancient ideas are actually highly advanced if we could get our head around them. So back to this slide again, again, sort of Western ideas, um, primitive origins, messing around in the forest, didn't really get up to anything interesting. But remember, this is all seen from our left brain perspective because it tends to, it doesn't deal with reality, it doesn't perceive reality, it just has concepts. And it's very, in, it's very impressed by kind of sterile, shiny things. That's somehow highly advanced. You see how the scales change, the sort of human scale. Somehow we've tricked ourselves into thinking that bits of shiny metal are more advanced than our state of mind. But even within kind of modern evolutionary ideas, there's still a lot of heated debate. There are theories how we got from the forest to becoming highly advanced today. Like I say I think it's back to front anyway. Um, but there is a mystery, um, still a lot of discussion as to how it happened, where did it happen. Um, and we already know that the tropical forests somehow have produced very large neural systems, very intelligent neural systems. There's more evidence coming out all the time that some of our living relatives are much more complex than we thought, much more intelligent and in ways we didn't recognize. We've got this very arrogant idea of what is intelligence, what is advanced. And again, that's what we need to be questioning. But there's been this, um, been this absolute resistance to consider the forest as a, uh, the forest played a major role in this. It's, it's like, well, we've got big brains in the forest already from the primates onwards through the apes and so on. We couldn't wait to get out of the forest. We couldn't wait to get onto the savanna or coast and coastal dwelling, and somehow that's where all the magic happened. I'm just scooting back between these. Just uh, the forest. This, this isn't actually tropical forest. I didn't uh, have an image at the time, but if you imagine tropical forests, everything we know about tropical forests. Remember, the data suggests that biochemically. They're the most complex ecosystems we know by light years. The chemistry in the forest, particularly the tropical forest, is off the scale. Any single species of tree living in the forest produces more chemistry than the combined pharmaceutical industry and some. By comparison, pharmaceutical industry is like a junior chemistry set. Single tropical tree produces thousands of chemicals. So we were living in the most complex molecular ecology we know. And it doesn't seem a hu huge leap to me that that might have something to do with producing some of the most complex neural systems we know. It's not a, it's not a huge leap. Most complex ecology we know from a biochemical point of view, most complex neural systems. And yet, as I say, there's been this absolute obsessive insistence that, oh no, our neural system evolved somewhere else. It evolved on the savannah, it evolved in hostile environments. Environments that are actually chemically very impoverished, there's no real complex chemistry there at all. And those environments never seem to produce large complex neural systems in any other species. So really just saying simple connections here. And it's interesting, it's in some of these ancient traditions as well. Some of the ancient traditions talk about forest origins, even going as far as saying we were fruit eating, which modern science would agree with. Our distant ancestors lived in the forest and they ate fruit. So there's no real contradiction there. Right, I'm going to stop for a short break and then we'll get into a few more specifics of how that relationship might have impacted. Okay, so 10 minute break and then now. Uh, Start again. <laughs> 